Ray Richardson, I want you to stand. He has just entered the ranks of the officially retired. What? Oh, your dad did. You know, I was missing something here. God, you know what's really funny? I was talking to you yesterday, thinking I was talking to your son, and I'm saying to your son, which was really you, saying, God, you sound just like your dad. So your dad retired at 81 years old. Just about 81. He didn't want to wait for the last minute, you know. <laughs> didn't want to just kind of rush into anything. Oh, so you're still among the rest of us working guys. Oh, well then sit down. Have a good time. Take a, take a load off, you know. Rest those weary legs of yours. Right. You know, I'm, I'm 55. Oh man, oh man. When I'm almost 81, then I can retire, yeah. You know, it'd be good to be still doing this at 81. I'm going to do, you know, obviously if the Lord hasn't come back and I'm able, I'm going to be doing something. You know, I think I'll be a greeter at Maranatha. I'll be a greeter, you know. Greeter at Walmart. I can, I'm already a greeter at Walmart. What are, you, what are you talking about? Every time I go in there, I'm a greeter at Walmart. They just don't send me a check, that's all. You know, for those of you who have been visiting, um, the last couple of weeks especially, I almost need to apologize to the Headleys, Jerry and Linda, said I'm really sorry that, that I'm coming back because Pastor Bob and Bill have been here filling in and uh, they do just an absolutely marvelous job, don't they? They really do. They really do. It's just so fun to watch uh, Pastor Bob and Bill develop and grow. They are excellent ministers of the gospel. Um, our whole staff, just great. Just great staff around here. Fantastic. Um, it's kind of nice to feel the freedom. I can leave now and know that everything's going to be doing well. Praise God. We are in a series this summer of going through some of my favorite psalms. This morning is Psalm 51. But before you turn there, I want you to turn to 2 Samuel chapter 11. 2 Samuel chapter 11, beginning at verse 1, and I'll skip around. I don't really know what verses I'm going to touch on yet until I get there. So, In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Amorites, Ammonites and the besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. You know, it's interesting. It says that in the spring when kings went off to war, David was supposed to be off in war with his men. But where, where was he? He stayed back. He was getting a little, I don't know, lazy, sloppy. Who knows? It says, but he remained in Jerusalem. One evening, David got up from his bed and watched around, walked around the roof of his palace. And from the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. Um, it's really interesting. A couple weeks ago, I got a letter from a lady who had visited our church. And man, she just, just railed on me one side and down the other. Um, because I had quoted from uh, Song of Solomon. You know, talking about this religion to me, this religious experience with Christ. Remember a few weeks ago, the last time I preached here? Um, I was talking about how our, my relationship with Christ is, is, is full of passion, it's love. It, it, it's like uh, the difference between, you know, this stodgy religion would be like kissing your sister as opposed to being in an intimate relationship with your wife. There's a difference. And, and I went on and I, and, and I got a letter. Man, I tell you, she just... I've never seen such vulgarity from the pulpit and blah, blah, blah. And, I should step down and everything else. I, I mean, you know, friends, I, I didn't write this. I'm not sure if we should even notice, but it says she was very beautiful. It doesn't say she was beautiful. It says she was very beautiful. Now, I'm not so sure if we should even be able to notice things like that, according to that woman who wrote me this letter. Yeah, I love about what it says about Esther. Esther, it says, she was Beautiful in form and features.
Some of you, some of you hope when I go there. Some of you hope when I don't. <laughs> Who noticed enough to write it down? And was was that a, a sin to write it? Down? Was it a sin to notice? Was it? I mean, what? I remember as a young teenager, I asked God one time. I says, God, what were you thinking when you put breasts right out front? What were you thinking? Did you know how maddening that was going to be? It's like, yeah. But I couldn't put them on the back because that'd make dancing way, way too interesting. <laughs> I mean, let's just bury our head in the sand and pretend none of this exists. Oh my God. And, and then call it holiness. That sounds really nice and religious, doesn't it? I tell you what, the Bible says the truth will set you free. I really believe that the Catholic Church and the church at large has so many problems because we stuff truth and it squirts out sideways. Again, we call it holiness. That's another sermon. He noticed the woman was very beautiful. David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Elam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. David sent his messengers to get her. She came to him and he slept with her. Then she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David saying, I'm pregnant. So David sent word to Joab, send the Uriah the Hittite. Joab sent him to David. They were out in the battle and says, hey, send, he sent a message out there to the battle. He said, hey, send Uriah back home. Then David said to Uriah, Go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah left the palace, and a gift from the king was sent after him. I mean, David is going to try his best attempt for a cover-up. He actually gives him gifts. Here, gives him gifts. Bring these to your wife. But Uriah slept at the entrance of the palace with all his master's servants, and he did not go down to his house. David was told, Hey, Uriah didn't go home. So he asked Uriah, haven't you just come from the military campaign? Why didn't you go home? I mean, what's natural? Would you want to go home? And Uriah said to David, the ark of Israel and Judah are staying in tents. And my commander Joab and my Lord's men are camped in the open country. How could I go to my house and eat and drink and make love to my wife? <gasps> I was going to skip that part. <laughs> as surely as you live. I will not do such a thing. Man, you're, this Uriah, he was a man of terrible, in incredible integrity and commitment to the fellow men of his, of his platoon. Then David said to him, stay here one more day. Tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem in the next, uh, in Jerusalem in the day and then Jerusalem that day and the next. At David's invitation, he ate and drank with him and David made him drunk. He is trying everything. But in the evening, Uriah went out to sleep on his mat among his master's servants, and he still didn't go home. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it to Uriah. In it, he wrote, Put Uriah out in the front where the fighting is fiercest, then withdraw from him so that he'll be struck down and die. So while Joab had the city under siege, he put Uriah at the place where he knew the strongest defenders were. And the battle was the most intense, and he drew back. Verse 25. When Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. After the time of mourning was over, David had her brought to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. The Lord sent Nathan, the prophet, to David. And when he came to him, he said, there were two men in a certain town. And he tells this wonderful story, which really angers David because he said, how could somebody be so cruel? And basically, when he finished the story, David answered, how could somebody be so cruel and so selfish? Nathan put his finger in David's face and said, you are the man. You're the one. 
verse 9, Why did you despise the world, despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and you took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Amorites. Verse 13, David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Psalm 51, some of you know, some of you don't know, but it is the, the, the result of that situation. That situation happened in David's life, and Psalm 51 was the outcome. It is his lament, his penitent psalm. In traditional Christianity, uh, down through the, the, the centuries, there are seven penitential psalms, 51 being the one in the, right in the very middle, just coincidental. There's three, six, 32, 38, then there's 51, and then Psalm 102, 130, and 143 are the traditional classic Christian history penitential psalms of the church. It's kind of unique about Psalm 51. I always try to give you just a unique uh, insight into the psalm that we're in. It's constructed with, uh, it's constructed symmetrically in the fact that the beginning two verses are the, are, they have two verses as an introduction, they have two verses as a conclusion. The five stanzas in Hebrew in the middle that maintain the bulk of the uh, psalm is also, like I said, it's very symmetrical. It goes five lines, three lines, three lines, five lines, then the two lines conclusion. David is writing a psalm of repentance. Verse 1. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. It's kind of interesting. In verse 2 there, he uses just a, a pile of synonyms, all meaning the same thing. This idea of uh, your mercy, your unfailing love, your compassion. Blot out, wash away, cleanse. They're all synonyms for basically, God, I don't want it anymore. I want it out of here. Knowing that David was a man after God's own heart. God says of David, he's the apple of his eye. You can only, we can easily understand the great sincerity and the passion behind Psalm 51. He responded, David did, in, 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 a, in a great way. Although he was a scoundrel by doing what he did and then trying to cover it up and committing murder, going to the extent of murder to try to cover it up, when confronted by the prophet, he, he admitted it. He confessed it. He said, yep, you're right, I've sinned. And no doubt, his heart genuinely before God was broken. You know, as I, as, I, as I just kind of think about that whole thing, I think about, you know, we can read the story like we just did of David, and we can go, you scoundrel. But we know ourselves, at least I know about me, how many times I don't just fall into sin, at times it's planned. At times, when you hear the, feel the Holy Spirit's nudge, saying, don't go there. Don't entertain that. Just don't do it. You do. And that was worse to try to hide it. You hide it first from your own self, your own honest conscience. You try to justify it. You start going through all those antics of trying to say, well, you know, you don't say, well, I'm David. But you got this idea that, well, well I'm, I'm entitled. Nobody will know. When I read Psalm 51, I, it's, it's one of my favorite psalms in the sense that, Lord, I hope and pray that I'll be more quick, instead of to defend, to confess. When your Holy Spirit knocks on the door of my heart, 
I love it. He, he, first thing he says, have mercy on me, God. God, have mercy. The mercy of God that rests on every one of us. You know, it's because of the mercy of God that you and I get to live. Have mercy on me, O oh God. I love it how quickly he kind of reminds him, according to your unfailing love. And he knows it's true. But he's counting on it. God, your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. You know, there's something about when you're in known sin, you're in reveals, you just feel dirty. It's kind of like Adam and Eve in the garden. They knew what was right to do and they sinned. And what was their first reaction? They wanted to cover themselves. That was the first reaction, to cover themselves. You know, when, when they covered themselves, God said, well, who told you you were naked? The, the first thing is, I, I feel like I need to cover myself. The second thing is, the feeling of wanting to go hide. You know, I, I, I think back, um, tragically, in 34 years of being in the ministry, I have seen far too many people screw up. I mean, and really mess up, okay? Tragically, the church, and I mean the church at large, has not really grasped a handle on how do we reach out to those who have really messed up. We say that we believe that God forgives, amen? Amen? But when somebody really messes up, they feel ashamed and they got to cover up and they feel like, I got to just go hide. I just, I don't want anybody to see me anymore. I don't want to be around. And we feel somewhat justified that, well, that's right. You, sh man, you shouldn't be around here. Now, we don't actually say that, but if they were here, we would have that feeling of, well, you hypocrite, what are you doing here? Friends, we're all hypocrites. We all sin. In fact, I believe it's the one single biggest thing that hinders our unashamed, unabashed worship and praise, stepping into His presence, is the sin that we are aware of in our own life. It's what keeps us at bay. Because we don't want to be that hypocrite. We don't want to be that phony. So it's that sin in our life that keeps us from just wholeheartedly entering and worshiping Him, praising Him because of His plenteous forgiveness, because of His grace and His mercy that's evident in our life every day. But we harbor these sins in our lives that we have not yet really come to full terms with and said like David, cleanse me from my sin. Friends, at communion time this morning, at the end of the service, I'm praying that each one of us will come to an incredible place where we will say like David, Lord, cleanse me. I, I don't want to be a hypocrite anymore. I don't want to hide it. Everybody thinks I got to... God, you know. God, you know. And I want to be free. I mean, really free. Verse 3, for I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. What a sense of coming to terms with owning it. He's not blaming it on, well, it was a really sleepless night, or she shouldn't have been there. You know, she was asking for it. You know, no, he owns up. He embraces it. He says, it's, it, it's me. God, I, I'm well aware of the fact that I know my, my transgressions. My sin is always before me. And then in verse 4, there's this wonderful passage that could be confusing at first. 
it could cause us, if we don't understand it properly, um, to not ask other people to forgive us and say, well, I've asked God to forgive me. That's not necessarily what he means. What he's saying is, first and foremost, in this incredible relationship with God, he is saying, against you and you only have I sinned. I've done what is evil in your sight. What he's making reference to is something that everybody knows. Everybody knew. I mean, he was a Jew. It's the covenant, Exodus chapter 20. <coughs> he knew the, the uh, commandments. He knew the commandments 6, 7, 8, and 10. Verse 13, you shall not commit murder. It's exactly what he did. You shall not commit adultery. That's exactly what he did. You shall not steal. It's exactly what he did. And you shall not covet your neighbor's house, nor shall you covet your neighbor's wife, or his male, or his female servant, his ox, or his donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Especially, David, you, you have so much. Who are you to want anything else? He says, God, against you, first and foremost, I, I realize that I have sinned. Friends, and you and I, when we sin, it affects other people. The consequences of this sin is going to be the death of that child. Which brings in a whole other realm of things that I wouldn't have time to even begin to address this morning. But He realizes, God, before you and you only, man, first and foremost, I've sinned against you. You know what's really interesting about you and I? Or at least, okay, I'm not sure about you, but I think you're a lot probably like me. When I sin, I usually think about this thing right away. Who's going to find out? Who's it hurt? How's it badly going to be? You know, blah, blah, blah. If I don't do this or if I do this. and David had this, this thing saying, God, I, I want my relationship with you to stay open and clear. And he realized right away, God, this stands in the way between us. I have, without regards, went against what you said. I basically was so selfish thinking that I can do it, even though you said not to, I could do it. Oh, against you and you only have I sinned. I've done what is evil in your sight. I like it. He didn't say, I did what was wrong. He uses the intensity of words to match the intensity of his offense. I did what was evil. See, we think about the devil as evil, but friends, we need to think of sin as evil. Sin is not an oops. Sin is not a slip. I mean, you can enter into it that way. But fundamentally, sin is evil. And it is crouching at the door, seeking to devour you. So you are right in your, in your verdict. I, I like this. When he talks about, hey, God, against you only I've sinned. And he, then he says this. He affirms this idea that, God, you're God. You can do whatever you want to do. You can kill me right now if you choose. He says, so you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. God, whatever you want to do, you can do. He is not going to begin to even, at this point, begin to argue with him. Reminds me of Job chapter 40. Don't bother turning there. But I just was in my devotions just a couple days ago. So I'm like, ah, it's really cool. Um, because I just I stand in awe at things like this. The Lord said to Job, Will the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? i just like, wow. God steps up and says, listen, if you want to argue with me, that's one thing. But you're going to try to give me advice? You ought to be careful, God is saying. You're going to give me advice. The creator of the universe. David here acknowledges you are the creator of the universe. And God, whatever you decide, whatever you decide is not even going to be thought of as unfair. Your verdicts are true. 
whatever you decide is just and right. In Romans chapter 3, verse 4, it says, the Apostle Paul says a similar thing. He says, uh, you know, is God being unfaithful? He says, not at all. Let God be true and every human being a liar. As it is written, so that you may be proved right when you speak and prevail when you judge. God, you, your verdict, and you are justified in everything you do. Verse 5. Surely I was sinful at birth. Sinful from the time my mother conceived me. He's going on, not trying to justify, not trying to give me an excuse. He's just saying, God, I understand. Really, what he's heading to is this idea that, God, I understand that all men, every one of us, are desperately corrupt. And apart from you, we have no hope. He says, surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness, even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Next week, we're going to be going to Psalm 139, which is address, addresses this concept. So I'll wait and address some of this uh, next Sunday when we look at Psalm 139. But this idea that God was putting us together, knitting us together in our mother's womb. He's basically saying, hey, you taught me wisdom in that secret place. In Romans chapter 2, Apostle Paul says the same thing. Hey, put in every man's knowledge of God. He gives us that start. What is right and wrong. As we grow older, and you hear me say it almost every single baby dedication, this child is pure and innocent, doesn't know right from wrong. But when it understands right from wrong, it will choose wrong. Why? Because it's got the sinful nature in them. <coughs> Verse 7. Cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. He's, he's saying, God, I know of your faithfulness, and I know it's true. God, if you will cleanse me, I'll be clean. And the hyssop there is, is like a bunch of branches and he's, he's really going back to what every Israelite would have understood very clearly because it was first used in the Passover when they took the, the branches, the hyssop leaves and they dipped it in the blood and they sprinkled it and splashed it on their, door, on their doorposts so the angel of death would pass over. And that's basically what David is paying a direct correlation to. Cleanse me. Cover me with hyssop with the hyssop and I will be clean. I know it to be true. You know, for you and I, John, 1 John 1, 9 says, if we will confess our sin, he is faithful and just and will forgive us from all iniquity. Friends, that is the truth. You and I can count on it. And you and I as believers need to know just because you gave your life to Jesus, it'd be great if it was clear sailing from there, wouldn't it? We need to, on a regular basis, confess our sin to Him. I, I love this atmosphere that Maranatha, that we have cultivated. Unlike a lot of other churches where you can't talk openly and you can't be real, you can't let people see that you had sin. Man, I love around here, maybe almost to a fault, I don't think so, but I love it around here. We let people just be you. We all realize that none of us are perfect. And that produces such a, a grace-filled environment where we realize that I'm not perfect. I'm going to go confess my sin to the Lord. I'm going to move on from here. It's not like you're judged and forever damned because you've fallen down and scun your knee. He says... Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I'll be whiter than snow. What a concept. Friends, I know that I'll be whiter than snow. I don't know about you, but one of the hardest things to get in your head and in mine is this idea that when Jesus forgives you, when he forgives you, you are forgiven. It's one of the hardest concepts. You know why? Because you're still aware of your sin. Susan, you look just so lovely and so wonderful. I can't imagine that you do much wrong, but I'm assuming you, you're human. You probably have. 
Indeed. Indeed, you've asked him to forgive you. But is it just as easy to forgive yourself? A little harder. After you learn it, you've got to walk it out. I tell you what, so many of us, we carry around the stains in the memory of our own short, because we knew better. It's like, we, oh, you know. You know what we do also, I think, by, by remembering what we did wrong? We're allowing ourselves a little bit of an open door so we can do it again. Sometimes. Do you realize that the major biggest screw up that if anybody in this room were to see it and know it, if they knew your past, if they just knew your story, you would just, oh, it would crush you. You would, it'd be devastating. You need to know this. Jesus forgave you. You need to forgive yourself. You need to quit thinking about it. You need to quit thinking about it. You're free. Whiter than snow. If you forgive me, when he said, I know you will cleanse me whiter than snow. Lord, do you remember, do you remember that sin that I did? He goes, no. Really? Yeah, I don't remember. I forgot it. Then he almost would like to whisper in our ear and say, I wish you'd forget it too. Because holding you back. Man, I tell you what. Incest, rape, adultery, drug addiction, thievery that follows. Man, there's some ugly things in our past. There's some ugly stuff. And we allow it to stay there. For fear that someday somebody might really find out. You know something? If the Lord forgave you, because you've asked him, if you ask him, he will, then you're free. You are really free. And somebody comes up to you and says, hey, you know, well, I heard that you, you know, I don't know how I heard, but I heard that you would, and you can just say, yep. You can almost say it with a smile. Not exactly a smile, but you say, yep. That's true. You get rid guess what, it's all taken care of, it's free. You are free. Thank you, Jesus. So many of us, with some of this ugliness in our past, we walk around this life like a second-class Christian. We just kind of walk around hoping nobody ever finds out. Hoping. So we, so we guard this thing. Again, not that you want to stand on the rooftop and tell everybody. There's one you want to tell. That's Jesus. Jesus, be merciful to me, a sinner. David, in this, in this anguish, feeling so embarrassed by what he did. He says, let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. God, I, I, want, God, I want to be restored back to this place. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquity. He's kind of recapping what he did earlier, again, in that, in that symmetry of the psalm. Blot it out, hide it, I'm embarrassed. Verse 10, create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Friends, that is a great prayer for you and I to pray. Create in me a pure heart. What he's saying basically, God, create, create in me. You're going to, have to do something totally new. God, I want you to do something totally new. For me, the whole heart of the, ver of the uh, Psalm 51 hinges on verse 11. To me, verse 11 is the key verse of the whole psalm. It's what motivated it from the very beginning. David comes to verse 11. Do not cast me from your presence. Or take your Holy Spirit from me. You see, remember earlier when he said, Against you and you only have I sinned? It's at the very heart of this. God, I do not want to lose you out of my life. God, do not 
Get rid of me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. One of the tragedies, and I think one of the saddest verses of Scripture is from the story in the life of, of Samson. Samson and Delilah. You know the story. Tragically, and I forget what verse it is, but in my Bible it's underlined. It, it says, I will go out as at other times and shake myself and the Spirit of God will come down. And it says, he did not know the Spirit had left him. Friends, how many times we go out and we think, well, God's used me in the past and this, I, I, I'm good. I, I'm just going to go out and do this. And he was flirting with sin. It says he didn't know the Spirit had left him. David, more than anything else, God, I do not want you to leave me. I think, God, give your church that kind of passion. That we would be afraid of sin because it would separate us from you. Instead of dancing with sin, flirting with it, God, may you bring us to this place where we would hunger. We can't live without your presence. And the thought that you would leave us. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Not my salvation. He says, of your salvation. God, how you redeem, you save. Grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. I love it. Verse 11 is just a result. He's, he's saying that it's just a natural result of truly being free and having this relationship with God is that we witness, we evangelize, we share our faith. And again, friends, if we're not sharing our faith, could it possibly be because we're harboring sin in our life? And we know that someday somebody's going to say, oh, hey, you, yeah, you, you claim to be a good old Christian. Yeah, but look at all this. So we let that hold us back. He says, God, let me come into that, that joy again. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will turn back to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O oh God. You who are God, my Savior, open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O oh God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. You, God, will not despise. This idea of being honest. God, David saying, David, God, I know that if I come to you and are honest, that's what you really want. So many people used to come to the temple and make great rituals by offering all the sacrifices and all that. In fact, if you just turn back in your Bible into Psalm 50, Psalm 50, just the, verse, the, the Psalm before that, starting at verse 9, God is speaking. He says, I have no need of a bull from your stall or of goats from your pens, for every animal of the forest is mine. So when you bring me a bull, basically you're just giving me back what's already mine. The cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird in the mountain. And the insects in the field are mine. God, I don't like that one. <laughs> it says all the insects are his. I love this. If I were hungry, I would not tell you. For the world is mine and all that is in it. I do not eat the flesh of, bull, of bulls or drink the blood of goats. He says, you do not delight in sacrifice. Verse 51, Psalm 51, verse 16. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O oh God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart you, God, will not despise. Friends, this morning, as the preparers prepare to serve as communion, why don't you guys find your positions? As we come to the Lord's table this morning, I invite you to come with a serious tone. 
One that will bring tremendous freedom to the degree of your honesty. Saying, God, I come with a broken and contrite heart. You and you only know what's been going on. God, I want you to forgive me. I want you to forgive me. God, I want you to forgive me. I admit that I have done wrong. It wasn't so-and-so who caused me to send that email. It wasn't somebody else that caused me to get so angry. No, it was me, God. I am guilty. He says a broken and contrite heart he will not despise. He ends with the, the summary of the two verses in that symmetrical um, composure. He says, May it please you to prosper Zion and build up the walls of Jerusalem. It's kind of interesting. The first two verses had to do with him personally. The last two verses have to do with him in his job as the king in his office. Now he's thinking about Jerusalem. May it please you to prosper Zion to build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in the sacrifices of the righteous. He will delight in the sacrifices of the righteous. He will delight in the sacrifices of those who are sincere. In burnt offerings offered whole. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. The altar without the sincerity did not mean a thing. 